When it comes to the number of Americans who say they believe in God, no matter how the question is asked, the percentage of people believing in God has trended downward significantly since the early 2000s. According to a June 2022 Gallup poll survey, Gallup found that 81% of Americans expressing belief when asked the simple question, do you believe in God? Well, in just five years, this dropped from 87% in 2017. Now, it now sits at a record low for the same question first asked in 1944, when 96% of Americans then said they believe in God. And the high mark was 98% in the 1950s and the 1960s, when our motto of In God We Trust was adopted in 1956. So according to that survey and others, if the question becomes more specific, such as, are you convinced that there is a God, and do you believe in Him? Now get this, the numbers are nearly cut in half. So in a practical sense, for Americans, it cannot be said any longer that at any level that our national motto, In God We Trust, established in 1956 under President Eisenhower and placed on our currency, is any longer true. It is in reality a witness against our nation. This fact goes to the heart of the lawlessness and the injustice we're witnessing across our land. But our relationship to God is all important if we hope to stay free and prosperous. So here's the question. So what does the Bible say about who God is, His character and His nature? Now the Bible declares that God is many things, and we certainly cannot exhaust who He is because He's beyond all understanding. Yet in His Word, God does tell us some key things about his character, and his person. So in today's program and for the next two weeks, Isaac and I are going to embark on a three-part series, each of these focusing on various character traits that give us an idea about who God is, and what He expects of us, and why we should love and obey Him based on who He is. Now in today's program, we're going to identify five of the better known traits of the God of the Bible. These are the ones we'll talk about today, and just briefly. God is just, God is holy, God is love, God is good, God is merciful. Together, these five demonstrate to us the personal aspects of God. And without understanding these, we'll never understand sin, or evil, or heaven, or hell, or understand the basis of the relationship God has as our loving yet holy Father, and what He desires of us, without understanding that, well, when we do know these things about God, we can live with confidence, and power, and great excitement, and purpose in our earthly life. And so with that little bit of a setup, Isaac, let's get right into it, because you know, uh, with prayer and trepidation kind of w embarked on this because you could go for weeks, you've preached sermons, we could, you could go forever talking about the character traits and the na character and nature of God. But we're going to try and do that in these three today, in, in these programs. Today, more of the personal relationship aspects of God. Next week, then, we'll deal with more of the governmental aspects of God, and He has a role there, it's different. And then we'll conclude with the future relationship of uh, God as King of Kings, and that's a great one. But um, let me just start with you right now. The God of the Bible uh, is a majestic and awesome God, but He provides a, a relationship that we can have with Him as Father. Hmm. That's an incredible thing. Can you take and describe that a little bit about how that is and how that can come about, but God as Father. Yeah, and, and as a father, that's the, the most personal, uh, you know, kind of type of, of relationship you could think of in a familial way 
Um, well, he also is, is uh, the husband, too. <laughs> and you know, these family mm -hmm. relationships are so personal, so intimate. Um, John chapter 1, he says that, that Jesus came into the world. He was the living word, and his own received him not. But those who believe on him, he's given them the power to be called the sons and daughters of God. Romans chapter 8, Paul talks about that personal. He says, it's Abba, Father. That's the, the word for daddy, um, that, that we have the spirit. We've been given the spirit to cry out, Abba, Father, and the Holy Spirit testifies of that spirit within us, Jesus himself uses that term, Abba, Father. And I think that helps us understand this relationship we have with him by the relationship that Jesus had when he was on this earth. And that that is so intimate, so close, so personal. And yet with that personal closeness we have to him, not just of a father, you know, some distant, but of a little child coming to him. Because we've all seen big men that they, their little child comes to him, the little toddler comes up to them, and all of a sudden they're, they're doting on that little child. It just melts their heart. We have that picture, and yet with it, Jesus, in, 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 at the end of his ministry, as he's getting ready for the crucifixion, Mark 14, he cries, Abba, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. But nevertheless, there's then this reverence of God's righteousness and God's justice. But nevertheless, your will be done not mine. And so that, this balance of having mm -hmm. that personal relationship with God, uh, that's, that's a special relationship. And we, we want to look into that balance. We want to talk about God's holiness and that God is just. We're going to take a brief time out. When we come back, we'll look at that characteristic of God. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs. The pastor, commentator, or frontline combatant. Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution, educating, informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Sam, as we got started with this program, you were talking about kind of the difficulty, the difficult task of, of talking about knowing God, and yet, it is necessary because we don't talk about him enough. And, and some of the best old hymns and, and things that we sing, they are taking people's prayers of affirmation, taking a truth about God and affirming it you know, through prayer or things. And so we need to talk about God. We need to talk about Jesus, who he is, what he has done. And, and you, you, in this program, you've kind of gotten it started talking about him in a personal way. We said he's our Abba, our daddy. And yet, even though he's, it's this personal God, who's not some God away out there that just doesn't care, He's, he's very involved in our lives. We have to see him for who he is. And one of the things that he is, is he is mm. just. Can you talk about that, what it means that we serve a God who is a God of justice, a, a very just God? Uh, I can, Isaac. And, uh, and I think, you know, I think this is interesting because most people, and we'll talk about God as love, but if you ask most people, say, what's, a, what's the major characteristic of God? They'll say, well, well God is love. Mm. Well, he is, and we're going to talk about that. But before that comes the primary, I think what the scripture teaches, the primary characteristic of God, and that is God is just. Mm. Now, what does that mean? Well, it, def it means morally upright. Um, morally upright is honest. It means conforming exactly to the laws. Now, that's interesting, a definition, because we're talking about the Bible, we're talking about God. Whose laws? We're talking about God's laws. <laughs> so the same God who is just is the God who laid down the laws and Isaac, the expectations for how things ought to be, but he makes it so that he consistently operates mm. according to the standards that he puts down. That's just, that, that's just number one. Number two, um, just has with it the concept of, uh, of a legal component. Um, just is connected with judge, and we're going to talk about that next week. But, but, but judge and just also has with it justice. A person who is just in the capacity of judge, but is, brings justice. 
All right, justice is according to the proper administration of the law, which is there. That's what, that's what he does. And it's associated with authority. So, so that, that's where it gets. The third one is, um, the, uh, is justice comes from the legal word, which we'll talk about more later. Um, from just comes justified, mm. comes justification, which is a part of a manifestation of God's love, which we talked about. But it comes from the fact that God is first of all just. But it is one of those things where all through Scripture, we are told in Scripture to be just. Now, here, here's an example. Uh, Leviticus 19.36 uh, talks about this. Um, a nation that is just operating according to God's law must have just balances, just weights, mm -hmm. just ephah, just hin. In other words, in everything that is done, it's got to be just. Later in Deuteronomy, it talks about just judgment. So, just is something that is according to a law, God's law, no movement, perfect adherence. And see, that's where we start with God. God is perfect. He is unchanging. He's unchanging according to His law. And that is where it starts. So that's, God is just, first of all. But Isaac, there's another one that's close, that's connected as well. We're also told in Scripture that God is holy. Mm. You can expand upon that, please. Well, I think those two in particular are very closely related. In fact, when you look at Leviticus and you see God described uh, as a just God, you will see Him then also as holy. The, the idea of holiness is uh, a, a purity that's in there, a, a cleanliness, uh, pure motives. In James chapter 1, uh, you have James talking to the church. It's been spread all over. It's one of the earliest, theologians believe it's one of the earliest um, parts of the New Testament written. He's talking to people who were Christian Jews who had spread all over the Roman Empire, and they're being persecuted for their beliefs. And he's talking to them about different things, and he talks to them about trials, and he talks to them about temptations, and he reminds them that their temptations are not from God. He says, God will not tempt you with evil. God himself can never be tempted with evil, and he will never tempt you to evil. What is he talking about there? He's talking about God's holiness. He's talking about what Leviticus is describing in God, a pure God who has the best intentions, the best motives. And we all know people who want to see somebody else mess up. We all know people who cheer. Maybe, maybe in schools, they see somebody not get a good grade, and they say, well, that makes me feel better. We know people who gossip, and that's we do this ourselves. We gossip trying to pull other people down so that we look better. God doesn't do that. In His holiness, He's never trying to pull somebody else down or, or trick somebody. Um, you said that He's immutable. He never changes. That holiness that He was at the beginning or in Leviticus, it goes throughout Scripture. Uh, Peter talks about this, again, to, to the persecuted church. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 15, he says, As He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And, he, and then he goes upon God, who's a just judge. He says he judges us without impartiality. He's not pushing one balance down or not. And so this idea, and, and all these character traits of God are things that we, as God's children, we're, we're to be like that. We're to mo that he's the model for us. And so God is just, and he is pure without evil motives. And, and, uh, and that is a good thing, that, that an omnipotent God is just and that He's pure, He's holy. And, uh, and as we see that then, for example, like in James chapter 1, after we see God's holiness, then James is able to talk about how He never changes and He does what is, what is good because He loves us. So if you have this just God who is holy, now it gets us to the point where we can understand how that kind of God loves us. Could you talk about that, what that means, hmm. that God loves us and that He is love? I, I can. I'm glad you, you took and you built that out because God being just, God being holy, righteous is kind of in there the same way, is, is a standard of absolute and total perfection. But the problem was when God created us, He did create us also perfect. Mm. But sin came into this world, and all of a sudden now, things have changed. 
And that's when now for the first time, Isaac, I think we can begin to understand the love of God. Hmm. Because God as a just God, holiness, which cannot have any kind of error or sin, says, what do I do now with these people that I made? Created in my image for worship in me. Now look what has been done. So God had a decision. What am I going to do? Let them just die? Go to hell? I mean, what are they going to do? He stepped up with his plan of redemption. And in the love of God, huh, now we find out about the love of God, he said, I'm going to need to make a way. Now, the, the interesting thing about this, Isaac, is this. Our God is love. The Bible says God is love. But I've got to make a distinction here just briefly. From a human perspective, when we say to our spouse, I love you, honey, hmm. you know, or my child, I love you, my son or my daughter, we do. We have an understanding. We, we love them. We cherish them. But when the Bible says God loves us, it's a different word. It's a different, it's, it's an agape love is what the scripture calls a Greek, the Greek word agape. It's a self-sacrificing love that comes from God. And it is manifested, I believe, um, perfectly when in John 3, 16, the Bible tells us, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And He offered a way of salvation. Now, all right, so now that's, that's a picture of agape love. And Isaac, um, it's interesting that in that aspect of love, when Jesus, before He went to the cross, in the Last Supper with the disciples, His last command to them, I'm going to go, His last command was them, love one another. Mm. Agape love one another, not just enjoy friendship as, as guys. Agape love, self-sacrificing love, because by this the world will know that you are of me. So the challenge to the believing person who understands who God is, is that we are also to love others. But Isaac, I'm going to submit before we go on that a man, a person of us, we cannot ever possibly love, agape love, as God has loved us, until we've experienced God's love through salvation. Only then mm -hmm. can we understand. So this is a high standard. Mm -hmm. God's just, God's holy, God um, is love. But, but God is also good. Scripture says mm -hmm. God is good. Now, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know what that means, but explain a little bit what is God is good in the context. Well, and I'm glad that, you know, God as creator, who is just and holy, uh, that His love is a good type of love, because you can go throughout history and the, you know, the Greeks and the different ancients, their myth mythological figures that had godlike abilities. You start to give a person who is human, who has that fallen nature, uh, super strength or super knowledge, mm -hmm. they use it for, e it gets corrupted very quickly. But because God is good, He's not corrupted. Jesus told, if you remember the, the rich young ruler that came to Jesus um, uh, asking Him, you know, these questions in Luke chapter 18. In verse 19, He says, oh, you know, good rabbi, you know, what about this? And, and Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God. Because we're all corrupted. In our human nature, the only one who was human who, was, who wasn't fallen was Jesus. So Jesus is God, but only God is good. He's, he's got the pure motives again. He, he's doing what's right. And that is what I'm so thankful for in God, that He is good. Just like our you know, justices, our Supreme Court judges that are supposed to be just, um, we have problems with them. Sometimes they, they did it wrong. They weren't good. Or again, somebody, you give somebody power, maybe even law enforcement or whatever. You say, well, they don't always do it right because they're not 100% perfectly good. God is 100% perfectly good all the time. All the time, God is good. And that means that we can trust Him to make the best decision for me. Just like a child, uh, the, the parent that wants what's good for the child, they're going to do what's best for them, even if that's not what the child wants. God is going to do what's best for us. Um, the great uh, theologian and, and pastor, preacher, American preacher, uh, Jonathan Edwards, he said this, he said, The goodness of God is the life of the believer's confidence, the support of his hope, 
and the matter of his rejoicing. The believer desires to trust in God's goodness and not his own. And that's where it is. We can trust God. It comes back to this idea of being able to trust him. Okay, he is just and he's holy. Okay, that's good. He loves me. Well, how does he love me? He loves me with a good love. He is a good God. And therefore, my hope, my confidence can be in him. And in, in those, of us, those of you watching us today, we, we have a good God. He does not just what is right, but he does what is good. And there's no one but God who is good. And, and for us, we want to be good. Oh, you know, parents say to their children, oh, you be good. You know, you're going off to school. Or you're going over to the grandparents or whatever. Be good. What does that even mean if we don't know God? And so as we, we wrap things up, we're going to take a, a quick time out. And when we come back from this, we want to finish talking about who God is and look at as, as a God who is holy and just, that is also a God that is love and good, what that means when it comes to his mercy. And so we'll be right back to talk about God and his mercy. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV. Positively different. Watch Lighthouse TV wherever you go. Available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. You can view our in-house studio productions on demand or watch what's on the station right now with our 24-7 live stream. Search Lighthouse TV online on your streaming device or go to our website, lighthousetv.org for more information. Lighthouse TV, positively different. Same as we're talking about God and, and that he's a personal God. And that's what's so amazing about the true God because Mankind comes up with these different figures that they, you know, lowercase g, gods or idols, and, and they are all kinds of problems. <laughs> they have all kinds of problems, and they're not, they're not the kind of God um, who, who would keep this kind of a world going, uh, a world that was good before sin entered it. And so as we've looked at, at God personally, we see that personally he is a just God. Uh, he is holy, and yet he is a God of love. He is love, and he is good. And all of those things work together. It may not make sense at first to the human mind, but when we study scripture, when God talks about himself, they all work together. And as we look at those, those things that he is, it brings us to what you already talked about, that God is a just God. And so when man sinned, this was, we start to see his love. But in his love, we see that he was merciful. Because he loved us, because God loved us so much, he was merciful and he gave us mercy. Can you talk about that, what it means that we have a God who is merciful? Isaac, I think the mercy, uh, the mercy of God um, is, well, without the mercy of God, we wouldn't be sitting here. That's right. Uh, without the mercy of God, there would be no person in this world who would say, I am a Christian. Um, without the mercy of God, there would have been no crucifixion and death and resurrection and a promise of eternal life. Without the mercy of God and the love of God, which it's interesting because mercy and love are inseparable. Mm -hmm. But without them coming together on the cross of Jesus Christ when he came, we would have no hope of eternal life. Mm. It, it's, it's a mute point. But for a person, because we know, I think so many people these days um, say they believe in God, mm -hmm. but we know from the surveys that they don't really, in many cases, they've never really come to the point where they understand that they were really sinners. Mm. We don't understand that we're sinners in need of mercy and love until we understand the justice of God and that He has established a law, the Scripture, which we know from the book of Romans that the law is what takes us to Christ. So we know that we are condemned to death because we can't keep the law. Yep. And it's God's love for us because He knows we can't keep it. Mm. But He can't have anything not perfect in His sight. So He had to come up with a plan, Jesus Christ come on the cross. And, uh, and Isaac, that is the coming together of the mercy of God. So that an unbeliever, if you're watching me right now, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the love of God demonstrated by Christ on the cross 
as a part of God's mercy, extends to you the possibility to come to Christ by faith in repentance and become, as Isaac said at the beginning, God becomes your Father. For those of us who are believers, the mercy of God is ongoing so that when we sin, and we will, we can confess our sins, as James says, and He'll be faithful and just to forgive us, extend us mercy. God. Do we understand God this way? Makes all the difference in the world. The world does not understand God. I hope that you do and understand better. Now, next week, we'll come back and we'll talk about God in different capacity. God as judge, God as lawgiver, and God as king.